I've seen members of Congress stand up at conference meetings telling leadership that instead of wasting our time on a debate over legislative proposals, we should be out fundraising. Right now, members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70% of their time raising money. To receive a particular committee spot, you have to raise a certain amount of money for the party. First of all, it's totally unethical. It seems like it should be illegal. You know, they say they're trying to shrink government, but what they're really doing is just outsourcing it to contractors who then turn around and give political contributions. We have uh, over a trillion dollars in tax breaks per year in the tax code. There's no oversight on them. Do you know that we spend $50 billion a year on programs that don't even exist by law anymore? Most successful political movements in the course of our country's history have begun in the states. You know, it always seems weird to me when people refer to me as an activist. This is this incredible burgeoning movement on the rise. This is what we stand for. These are the policies that we seek to achieve. I think we have to recognize there's enormous potential to rally people from all political perspectives to the cause of reform. Because people on the left and the right both agree this system is deeply corrupted. everyone for joining us. Um, we've got more people coming in, but um, we'll get started just to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, and um, if you could mute yourself or make sure that you're muted before we uh, get started, uh, would be greatly appreciated. Um, my name is Jason Grant. I'm the Executive Director for Alaskans for Better Elections, uh, lifelong Alaskan here, and uh, happy to come in on a beautiful day here in Anchorage. It's about 70 degrees, uh, but um, happy to come in, as I said, to, to be a part of uh, this panel and hear from some experts, uh, both locally and nationally, regarding this very important topic. Um, hopefully you're here to uh, hear from a, uh, uh, these, these great speakers regarding the film, the uh, documentary Unrepresented. Uh, if you haven't checked out the trailer, we'll put that in the chat, or if you haven't checked out the, uh, the, the film as well, um, we'll put those links in there. You can check that out later, but uh, really looking forward to this great discussion. Um, if you haven't watched the movie or, or don't know much about it, uh, Unrepresented is a short film with a big message. Political corruption is ruining our democracy. It features, uh, this, this film features accounts by uh, advocates, academics, and government officials of the corrupt dealings that they have witnessed in the federal, congressional, and government. The documentary reveals the driving forces behind political corruption and the unprecedented reforms that we have right now to restore government that better serves the people. And tonight we are joined by, uh, as I mentioned, a, a great, a great panel uh, of experts uh, who are both working um, to expose uh, the corruption and also work towards eliminating it. Um, and they're building this this, uh, this great network across our country to discuss the challenges of fighting back against the big money corrupting our government. Uh, on the panel tonight we have uh, Daniel Falconer, who is the film director of Upper Unrepresented. Hi, Daniel. He's joining us from California, and so he was, even he was jealous of our great weather, he said. Uh, really, really nice day uh, here. Uh, maybe not, maybe, maybe not as nice in California. Uh, we have uh, a, uh, a former U.S. Comptroller General with uh, David Walker. He's here, if he can give us a wave. Hi, sir. Uh, we also have Alaska State Senator Bill Wilikowski. And then we have Julie Olson, who is with Move to Amend Alaska Chapter. And so, as we've introduced everyone, we're going to do uh, kind of a, a short question with um, all of the panel experts, and then we'll get into a deeper dive. And again, if you have questions, um, feel free to uh, put those in the, uh, the chat box. I'll be um, monitoring that uh, to see if anything comes up. But um, again, feel free to, to chat during, uh, during tonight's discussion. And so, uh, we are going, first, I'd like to chat with, uh, with Daniel uh, as the film director. Um, Daniel was born in Detroit, Michigan, and studied film at uh, NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. He wrote, directed, and edited the film On My Own in 2008, before dedicating the other three years to making the documentary The Force. And um, again, he is the director of the film Unrepresented, which we're speaking about tonight. So Daniel, um, what made you decide on this topic? 
obviously there's lots to talk about when um, dis um, discussing you know corruption and, or government or you know big money in politics. What what kind of, what was kind of the straw that that went toward that broke the camel's back and say this is a, a film that I'd like to make? Yeah, well, forgive me if I take a few words to answer because it's a broad one for sure. And Please. thanks to you and everyone else on the panel for being here. Thank you to the other Alaskans or folks in Anchorage who've sacrificed the beautiful hour outside. But it, it really started with um, wanting to understand better a subject we'd explored in our previous documentary, which you mentioned, DeForce. That's a political history of the city of Detroit. In particular, it examines the impact of policy, often unintended consequences of policy, but even policy that maybe was kind of malicious even in its design that becomes very difficult to get off the books or reverse the tide of. And we were just curious why it is that those directly affected seem to have so little stake. We talked a lot about factors that played into that, at least as we could observe and put together through history in our hometown, but the more we looked into the solutions that would be applied in that situation or any of the other things that might have frustrated us nationally, like the sensation of going to vote every two or four years and how little it seems to affect the issues that matter to you most, um, that's what got us going on wanting to take a greater look at that, at what it is that seems to rig the system or insulate politicians from the pesky will of voters in many cases. And it started with Andrew's very involved, my, my co-writer, producer, and very much a, like the, the dominant force, I would say, in getting this thing going in the first place. So that's why I bring him up in answering the question. Andrew is much more involved at the grassroots level on these things than I am. He gives more of his time to activism, at least than I did before working on the project. And he knows a lot of people who are very focused on attacking it from the dead angle. And so we kind of started there. With, there there's no question it's a scandal and it's an, an issue that needs to be addressed, uh, even from just from a national security standpoint, I would say, as I'm sure the controller can talk about. But uh, we, we started there and then we, uh, as much testimony as we received about the impact of the debt crisis and what might've motivated it, um, everything kept drawing, driving back to this question of representation of what there's this feeding frenzy to get paid out from the federal government. And that's a lot of what drives the printing of money or the issuing of debt, whatever, how, how, wherever stage in the cycle we're at. And th that's, that's all driven by the fact that people realize that if they spend, there's kind of this recipe to extract what you want. <laughs> and so if you spend here, spend there, as we talk about in the in the film, you know, open the doorway with the campaign contributions, then keep greasing the wheels with lobbying money. And those folks are, despite the title of the film, they're quite well represented. It's uh, they're they're often able to achieve policy ambitions, and at a minimum, they can definitely block what they don't want to happen. And that's why a lot of these long-standing reforms that you'll see people from the left and right both agree on, like let's end gerrymandering, let's get money out of politics. That's why those get blocked consistently. Um, so that's the answer. It all, it all started with wanting to understand why it is that even these, one, why bad policy sticks around, and two, why issues that even a supposedly or observably very divided country can still agree upon, why don't we get action on those tomorrow? It was, let's just start with that question and see how well we can answer it, or at least open the door to get people asking that question more often. So, I mean, I could go on, but I don't want to talk too long about that. That's, I'll stop right there. No, that's a great, no, that's a great uh, kind of entree into, um, you know, some of these other questions and, and, and deeper dive into the, into the film. I do want to um, actually move on to um, uh, the Honorable David Walker. Uh, as you mentioned, the, the comptroller, um, former, for, former U.S. comptroller. Uh, David is a uh, national, internationally recognized fiscal responsible, responsibility, government transformation, and retirement security expert. He has over 40 years of executive level experience in the public, private, and nonprofit sector, including heading three federal agencies, two nonprofits, and a, a leading global service line as well. Uh, and uh, Mr. Walker ser currently serves as a distinguished visiting professor and chair at the U.S. Naval Academy, where he teaches the economics of national security. And he has extensive nonprofit board and advisory committee experience. Uh, professor, or uh, uh, Comptroller Walker, um, or Dave, as uh, we'll be a little informal uh, here tonight. Um, 
you know, you, you just heard, heard from Daniel regarding kind of like the, the film, what kind of brought him to that. After, after watching this film, you know, how many times did you just shake your head and say, yes, oh my gosh, yes, I've seen that. I agree with that. What, or that's, he hit the nail on the head with that issue. Well, there are a lot of things that do resonate with me with regard to the film. You know, I've been involved in this fight from a number of different angles for a number of years. Look, my, my view is, is that we now have a republic that is not representative of nor responsive to the general public. Uh, and we have something that the founders never intended. It's called career politicians. Uh, you know, the founders intended for people to run for office as a public service for a short period of time to come to, from the real world to do temporary public service and to go back to the real world. Unfortunately, that's not what we have for the most part. And it's not just a matter of partisanship. It's a matter of the ideological divide. There used to be some overlap between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, now there's virtually no overlap. The margins, uh, it's tied in the U.S. Senate. It's closest it's been in years in the House. And so every election is about control. Who's going to maintain control? And that's everything. Um, you know, I, in 2012, did a 10,000 mile, 27 state national fiscal responsibility bus tour uh, and talked to representative groups of voters around the country. And one of the things that we talked about was not just fiscal sustainability challenges, but political sustainability challenges. And we got over 80% support for redistricting reform, integrated and open primaries, ranked choice voting, and 12 year term limits. But in addition to that, we got over 80% of support from representative groups of voters, okay, uh, on the need for campaign finance reform. Uh, and so many people believe, and I do, that until we end up dealing with some of our political reforms, we're not going to be able to address some of our real sustainability challenges, fiscal, environmental, infrastructure, immigration, health care, uh, and a variety of other challenges that we have. You mentioned um, you know, all these different topics that received just an incredible amount of support across the political spectrum. Um, you know, I mentioned we were talking earlier regarding the, the ballot measure that passed here in Alaska, and it, it, it passed just just barely. But one of the measures was about the you know really kind of exposure of dark money. And every time we did polling, that was in the 70s, 80s, upper 80s percent of Alaskans who said, yes, we need to do something about this. So it's not a surprise that uh, you know, across across the country, across the political spectrum, you're hearing you know support for these things that almost seem like common sense to say, yeah, that we don't want that anymore. That's the, that goes against kind of the core of who we are as Americans. Um, what was you mentioned several of them? Was there something that you saw, regardless of the region you were in, that always stuck out as going, yeah, that's a, that's a very high, very popular issue that we need to fix. Well, on the political reforms, all of the things that I mentioned got over 80% support. I mean, the, the thing that got the absolute most support, okay, was something called no budget, no pay. Uh, and that is, uh, in my lifetime, I'm 69 years old, although I don't feel it. Uh, and, you know, in my lifetime, Congress has only passed a budget and all the appropriations bills on time four times in 69 years. Uh, that's an F minus, and they're not going to do it this year. So the concept of no budget, no pay was if Congress doesn't pass a budget and all the appropriations bills by the beginning of the fiscal year, they don't get paid until they do, and they don't get retroactive pay. By the way, California did that several years back because they had a similar problem, and they've been passing things on time since then. You need to have the right incentives. You need to have adequate transparency and you need to have appropriate accountability. And if you don't have those three things, the system will not achieve sustainable success. And quite frankly, we don't have that in our political system right now. Yeah, I, I'd argue the right incentives, you know, nonprofit, for-profit government, the right incentives can really drive uh, towards good things. That's a great, that's an excellent point. We, uh, we passed something here a few years ago in Alaska regarding per diem uh, for, for legislators. If they couldn't pass something in a budget in time, they stopped receiving per diem. I don't know if it's working or not, because this was another year they've gone past that time, but um, we'll see. We'll see if uh, eventually it, it, it drives towards some good, some good, some good uh, results. I, I'd like to dive into, yeah, into the, speaking of what's going on here in Alaska, uh, dive into the localness of this issue. Um, Senator Bill Wilikowski uh, is a uh, Democratic member of the Alaska Senate representing District H here in Anchorage, Alaska, uh, includes the Spenard area and also UAA. 
Um, for many years, Willik uh, Senator Wolikowski has submitted legislation in Alaska um, in the form of a resolution that would support a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. And Senator, if you um, I can't see you on my screen, but I know you're here. Um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the effort in the Alaska State Legislature and the, the Alaska State Legislature regarding that resolution and what the response has been like? Um, I think you've been you've been um, fighting this issue obviously for eight, nine, ten years um, and submitting that resolution. What's what's been um, that those conversations with your fellow legislators been like regarding that resolution? Yeah, thank you. I I think I think early on in my legislature I came. Things were just fundamental. Go sort of collections, get one hearing, and then it never passed. We ran it as an initiative, and unfortunately, there was millions of dollars spent against it, and we were unsuccessful. Uh, with Citizens United, it's things have just gotten worse, and I think the public recognizes that there's there are just huge structural problems that you can't have a system where you have unlimited money flowing out, and that those who are wealthy, those who have unlimited resources, can just go ahead and and uh, dominate the airwaves and dominate what people hear about uh, the elections. So I think the public overwhelmingly supports it. Uh, the problem has been getting legislators to support it. And you know, in, in all the years we've, uh, we've pushed that and I, others have pushed that as well, uh, we've just never been able to, to get any real traction on it. It's just not something uh, that legislators wanna deal with. Uh, because they like getting the money for their elections. They, uh, and, and, you know, and I think, you know, I, I really enjoyed the film, Daniel. And I'll just say one of the, one of the things that really stuck out to me is it's, it's not that the legislators or the congressmen are corrupt. It's that the system is corrupt. That is the one thing that I think is just vital for people to take away from this. I don't think anybody goes into politics thinking they want to do corrupt things. I think everyone, I think just about everyone goes in with really good intentions. They want to change the world. They want to do good things. But the system is broken. And I think unlimited campaign cash is just a, a massive, massive problem. Senator, we, we mentioned probably it's, it's, it's an issue that's probably very popular with uh, constituents, um, very popular, obviously. Um, um, you know, if you did polling and, and went door to door and mentioned you wanted to do this, um, I'm sure you've heard from your constituents that they'd like to you know, see this happen. Talking to your, your fellow legislators about, hey, this is a very popular issue. This is this is a good win for everyone. Um, is it, it is it really? You think it would affect their campaign or who who um, actually you know some special interests or lobbyists? How they interact with them? What would be the biggest difference if, if something like this was overturned? Well, I think I, I you know right now what happens, and I've seen this. I've run a number of times. Uh, if you go up against a very powerful industry they will spend, you know, whether it's the left or the right, uh, whether it's, you know, um, I don't want to pick on any particular industry, but uh, if you go up against an industry, you can almost guarantee that in your next election, they will spend a massive amount of money to defeat you. Uh, I've been on the, the receiving end of, of hundreds of thousands of dollars against me because I've gone up against some industries. I know many others have uh, in the legislature as well. And I think, I think, uh, if you take that away, you will have, you know, our, our job and what I like to tell my constituents all the time is, hey, if you don't like the job that your representative or your senator is doing, vote them out. And, and unfortunately, what you have now is you have a situation where you have uh, people who are concerned about their elections and concerned that uh, if they do something that is not popular with a particular industry, there will be a boatload of money going up against them. Uh, I think it would definitely alleviate that pressure if you had something like uh, an overturning of Citizens United. Thank you, Senator. Um, I want to move on to someone who is, who is working on helping fight that fight here in Alaska. Uh, Julie Olson is um, with the uh, Move to Amend Alaska chapter. Uh, Julie Olson is a longtime Alaska resident uh, with a MBA from our local university of Alaska Anchorage. Uh, she spent her career in the private sector uh, 20 years in a global company, and now she is a business owner uh, with offices both in Alaska and Washington. Uh, she's been part of numerous volunteer and community organizations. Uh, she was the chair of her community council. She's been a part of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, she's been part of both the uh, Alaska Democratic Party and is also a, a representative. Uh, uh, she represents with the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. And currently she is a board member and treasurer of Alaska Move to Amend. Hi, Julie. 
Oh, are you on? I can unmute you. I'm sorry. Um, there we go. All right. Thanks, Jason, for that intro. Appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to make a couple comments, first of all, and this gets back to something uh, Dave was saying about how there's basically very little overlap today between uh, Democrats and Republicans. And I, I think that's really unfortunate because I think when you are out or when we're out talking to members of the public, many, many people, regardless of party affiliation or no party affiliation, actually agree with these basic principles in terms of getting big money out of politics, the negative influence of excessive lobbying and that sort of thing. So I think there's agreement among many Americans on those basic principles, but um, but we're not able to bridge that gap because of the labels that are assigned to people. And so I personally am really hopeful that the, um, the new primary set up in Alaska is really going to change that and allow people maybe with no party affiliation to come in and be more successful in those races. But I want to say that our group has been working really hard to um, towards the 28th Amendment and, and the 28th Amendment that we're advocating for uh, has two basic principles. And uh, one of those is that states shall have the ability and uh, the obligation to regulate campaign finance spending so that we're able to, uh, number one, limit the amount of campaign spending, certainly the amount of campaign spending by dark money groups, and be able to have the transparency and visibility to know who's backing which candidate. And that's one of the things that was addressed in the successful ballot measure too. And then uh, beyond that, the other principle that we think is really important is um, is making sure that um, that corporations are, are not viewed as persons and don't have the same civil rights as living, breathing human beings. So over the past hundred or plus years, a series of Supreme Court decisions have given corporations the same civil rights that a, a human being does, i.e. free speech rights. And so we think, again, it's really important to establish that a corporation should not have unlimited free speech and be able to spend millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars in a race in Alaska to defeat a candidate who might have suggested that we need some regulation of that industry. So uh, we're working really hard at that. Uh, we find the, um, the partisanship uh, that's going on in Alaska to be very challenging. And so we spend a lot of time reaching out to uh, various constituency groups to build awareness in people uh, about our common shared values. Julie, that, that, that's that's great. I was going to ask you more kind of about the strategy that Move to Amend is doing to kind of reach people and talk to people. What are some ideas that that you've seen from the movie that might make sense here in Alaska? Well, um, one, of, one of the challenges that we've had is reaching out to more uh, conservative groups. And it's really interesting because I uh, personally try to um, be very open-minded and get information from a variety of sources, but I had no idea that there was a group headed by Brad Keithley here in Alaska on um, fiscal responsibility. And so to me, I would like to reach out to Brad uh, after this panel to see if we can work together because we both have the same aim in terms of limiting or minimizing corruption in government, but we're attacking it from different angles. And I think it's really important that uh, there are a lot of issues, and, and I don't think everything would be solved if we passed a, a balanced budget amendment, or I think as Dave was advocating for a fiscally sustainable budget uh, type of amendment, that's not going to solve all the problems. There, there are a lot of um, areas that need to be tweaked in our democracy. And so I think that reaching out and being open to these other constituency groups is really important. That's a great, great, great insight. Um, and I do wanna remind people, if you have a question, please put it in the chat. Um, we can uh, make sure we can get to those and have uh, plenty of time uh, to respond to those and, and spread those out to the rest of the panel. Uh, Dave, you had your hand up uh, to respond, I, I think. Yeah, I did. I think it's important to talk about some of the things that achieve supermajority support from representative groups of voters in both the North and the South. And when I say representative, I mean demographically representative, Republicans, Democrats, unaffiliated, age, race, income, uh, all. And I think we have to keep in mind that based on the latest statistics that I've seen, a plurality of voters are unaffiliated like myself. 
uh, over 40 percent of registered voters in the United States are unaffiliated. And yet, you know, if you don't have integrated and open primaries, they're disenfranchised until the general election. Uh, if you have a closed party primary, which is a real problem, which is one of the reasons that you get the extremes, both on the left and the right, running off in the general election. So I compliment you on some of your reforms. But some of the reforms that got support were, A, transparency with regard to campaign contributions. And, uh, you know, Julie mentioned about uh, defining persons. Well, what we talked about was that the only people who could give money to campaigns were people who could vote. Uh, that's a novel concept. I realize that, but uh, it, it's one that makes a little bit of sense. It got over, overwhelming support. And by the way, it's not just corporations, it's unions and other special. They can't vote either. And they are special interest. Their members can, employees and officers of companies can, but the entities themselves cannot. And so I think if you're going to achieve real reform, you got to be balanced. You can't just focus on one type of special interest. You have to fo focus on all types of special interests. The way we view it, it would also apply to associations, nonprofits, et cetera. Right. So absolutely exactly. correct. If you can vote, then you can spend money in the election. Exactly. And some states, by the way, including Connecticut, where I lived for nine and a half years, have voluntary public finance. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't have to. You don't have to use it if you don't want to. But if you do, you get a certain amount of money from the state, uh, and your your contributions are limited to that amount of money. That's it. That's all you get. Was it successful? It's been reasonably successful. Yeah, it has been. That's for state elections. Obviously, not for federal elections. It's for state elections, including governor, governor, state uh, state senate, state house, uh, and and lieutenant governor, uh, all statewide offices. Interesting. I just have a quick question, if I may, well, since we're talking about things that polled popular well in the controller's uh, tour across the nation. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. I was just, first, I totally agree with the voter donor law and rolling back on corporate personhood. Uh, and it, it should apply, of course, not only to corporations, but organizations of all types. I even think, um, not just if you can vote, then you can give money, but all, but voter donor direct correlation. If I can't vote for you, I can't give money because it's pouring mm -hmm. across state lines. And even if I should be able to give money legally in America because I can vote, that doesn't mean I have a say in an election in Georgia or Alaska. And uh, But I can get on TV if I have a TV show and say what I feel. Sure, I'm a citizen, whatever. But as far as this money that's directly influencing things, it really should be more directly limited to the pool of people who in theory are picking someone to go off and represent their interests. Um, but yeah, I was really curious, controller, did there, you, when you talked about the, the term limit idea, was there any interest or was there a question asked about the revolving door and perhaps like a lifetime ban on lobbying, a career in lobbying after politics, because, or at least at the federal level, because we see a real linkage between that and the undue influence as well. So I was curious. Well, first, there was support for term limits, but you got to be careful when you talk about term limits. How long would the term be? Okay. You do need institutional memory. Uh, and so basically where we came to was 12 years, uh, which would be two Senate terms or six House terms. And there was also some discussion about whether or not you ought to elect half the House every four years. So you don't have to be, a, you know, so, you don't, so all members don't have to end up running every two years, if you will. I can tell you firsthand, having been in and out of federal office, you know, since the, the middle 1980s, um, members of the House with the possible exception of Don Young, I might add, uh, <laughs> the members of the House uh, spent almost half their time raising money, almost half their time raising money. Uh, and that includes when they're in Washington, all right? They have to go outside their office and either the Democratic National Committee headquarters or the Republican National Committee headquarters to do it because you can't do it for your office. But it's really outrageous how much uh, time they spend uh, raising money. Uh, and uh, your, 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 your second issue, Dan, what was the other issue you wanted to hear about? I was just asking about uh, the, the revolving door between yeah, yeah. having yeah. served. There, there's the there's support for a longer cooling off period. OK, um, not a not a lifetime ban by any means. But you got to be a little bit careful, too, because, you know, right now there are certain restrictions that exist. You know, you can't lobby for a period of time. Right. Uh, and, you know, in the federal government, depending upon whether it's an agency that you are in, you know, there's a longer ban than one that you weren't in, but you have a lot of people that come out of office and what they do is they don't, they're not a direct lobbyist, 
They're an advisor to an, a lobbyist. Okay. So they're kind of doing indirectly what they can't do directly. Um, um, so, you know, more needs to be done there. Uh, lifetime bans, though, I don't think would, would ever get the support, you know, uh, for a lifetime ban. Um, speaking of lobbyists and um, those who can kind of, um, you know, have that influence, uh, Senator Wolikowski, not to um, put you on the spot or, you know, hope this is not throwing you under the bus or anything, um, but this year, um, you know, the, the state capitol has, has pretty much been closed off to the public, including lobbyists. And you've been down in Juno a long time. What's how, how different has it been kind of working, legislating the vibe in the building as you don't have uh, you know, lobbyists and, and people in the halls and, and popping in and out and, and maybe having that more of that face time with, with, uh, with you know, fellow legislators this year? It, it's, <clears throat> yeah, it's been, uh, I, I would come back just about every weekend um, to Anchorage. I've got a 14 year old who's uh, eighth grade and uh, and every weekend when I would go and come back that even though you're right, the lobbyists couldn't come in the building. Uh, there were lobbyists on the plane, on the flight every weekend going and coming. And they were having private meetings outside the building. One of the best things and most interesting things that we did when I first got to Juneau, I uh, used to walk down by the Baranoff, which was a very popular um, hotel and, and a fancy restaurant. And you, you would literally see a third to half the legislature dining, eating out nice steak, shrimp, crab dinners with lobbyists. Uh, we passed a, a piece of legislation um, years, years ago, which uh, said that if, if a, a lobbyist takes you out to dinner and spends more than $14.99, they have to report it. And it, it, it was shocking the impact that that had. Uh, you, you no longer saw people dining out with lobbyists after that. It was, it was really, you know, something s so small like that would, would have that, that dramatic of an impact. But what you also saw was just, they started going behind the scenes, you know, and, and, um, and I think with Citizens United and so, so the, the really the loosening of campaign laws, um, you just saw things happening out in the open and, and, um, and uh, there was really uh, sort of no, no shame anymore. You know, we had we had a tremendous scandal for those outside Alaska years ago, where where legislators were were taped on camera accepting hundred dollar bills from lobbyists to take various actions. Um, nowadays, the the laws with campaign finance just so wide open, um, you, you just uh, you you just have big fundraisers now. And, and they'll uh, get people elected. The revolving door still exists in Alaska. So uh, it, it's just got, you know, in, in some ways it's, it's out more in the open, in other ways it's, it's still happening. It, 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 the, the laws we have in place have not stopped uh, the problem. You know, I think when you, when you tell something like that, Senator, you know, it's probably a little shocking. And, and um, uh, Comptroller Walker, you mentioned the, um, you know, that someone is, you know, these legislators are, are spending, you know, half their time uh, fundraising, you know, calling or having events. And that's that's in the trailer pretty prominently, uh, Daniel, about how someone, you know, each legislator in, in Congress has to spend so much time um, fundraising. And I think when people see that, it's pretty shocking and surprising to people. What, what else was, you know, when you were filming this and interviewing, what, what came to you? You had no idea. I mean, you went into this thing pretty eyes open. But what was shocking or surprising to you during these interviews? Um, that you really had no idea about, Daniel. Yeah, that's, uh, I I'm sure more will come to me. So if I like blurt something out 10 minutes from now while someone else is speaking, forgive me. No, but uh, off the top of my head, there were a couple of things from folks we talked to in the DC area, like Mike Lofgren's point about, and, and maybe it was something I understood on some level, but he framed it well about how you've had various Republican presidents talk about how they're shrinking government, trying to downsize it. And in fact, what they've done is just outsourced the function of government. And while Democrats may not have run on that so much as a slogan, they, if they come in and say that they're going to institute some fiscal responsibility or roll back the tide in this way against what their Republican predecessor or something had done, and it's going to be more responsible now. Same kind of thing, though. Regardless, the same general outsourcing of the functions of government uh, has gone on. And in particular, he talked about having been, I think, a 30-year career congressional staffer. He just talked about the hollowing out of Congress's capability and where 
staffers because of this revolving door situation and because the incentives when I show up as a highly educated individual who wants to have a good career, I thought in government, I thought that meant maybe working for 30 years for Congress and getting paid well for my and feeling good about what I do or whatever, like what Lofgren did. But maybe it turns out that if I respect myself and want to make good money, I should rotate out after about six years or maybe less and go work for one of those advisors. And um, that's where the real money is. And then now I can just trade on my contacts back where I used to work. I can get those people on the phone anytime. And so that's more useful to these industries or lot or um, trade unions, whatever they might be, you know, that want to have a disproportionate influence. So it, was, it wasn't just that the money facilitates that it was realizing how a an almost intentional hollowing out of the capacity of the supports of Congress, as they're, you know, bleeding that out of the budget, and then saying we don't have the money. So that's the reason that I've asked for this uh, particular lobbying firm down on K Street to help with the language of the bill. There's a lot of very exact legalese that has to go into it. And we just don't have the resources here to write it in house anymore. So that's the reason that that language came from them. It's not because they gave me all this campaign money. And so like, just how much we fed into that ourselves with the way we've handled Congress, the point that the controller made about the budget, same sort of thing, like in terms of passing only four of them in his lifetime. Um, like I was aware that it was largely dysfunctional in DC, but it, again, sitting down with Lofgren, hearing how he, like they just don't pass them on time. And um, th there's hearing from Amash how there's less and less even pretense around trying to pass one. And that for the most part, th they'll go ahead and pass a shell budget where they they're telling him, don't pay attention to the numbers. None of it matters. This is just something we have to do so that we can go to reconciliation and then draw it up some other silly way. Like the, the fact that that's actually what's going on on the floor of the house, you know, and then uh, th that kind of thing blew my mind. You know, I, 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 I didn't like the idea of all this disproportionate influence and money flowing around and dark money. Um, that's totally unaccountable. I, I had some insight into that. I thought maybe I'd get some staggering statistics but some of those inner working mechanisms were the real eye-opening thing for me. And maybe the last thing on that note is Bruce Bartlett pointing out that to this point of how, why the money gets involved in the first place, um, just how well it works for these industries or individuals that are able to be represented, where even if, you know, an anecdote is that say like Microsoft, when they first got huge, said they weren't going to lobby. They, they were too good to get involved in that dirty game. And before long, you realize that you have to because your competitors are going, if they can't beat you at, on the product level, if I can get a law passed that makes it illegal to sell Microsoft products in my state, that'll help. And so, I mean, that's a really oversimplified example, but you use the lobbying mechanism as a way to change the game. And so then whether you like it or not, you get seduced into lobbying. And then once you're there and you're represented by two or three powerful firms, next thing you know, it's a revenue center. Like you put in this, this law just to safeguard your industry, something you really care about. Some bad law was about to get passed that really would have cost jobs. And without a lot of effort that got changed, you, you were able to stop that from happening. And now you're like, well, that was easy. Maybe I should get a provision put in the tax law that will save me 3 billion annually. Why not? You know? And so it's this self-reinforcing dynamic. That was another big eye opener for me. Julie, I want to ask you, um, you know, you guys are doing work now, um, you know, on the grassroots level and really, pin, you know, person to person here in Alaska. If, if, if you got to tell one, each person in Alaska one thing about kind of the work that you guys are doing, why it's important, what, what would be kind of just the one real focal point? You know, if you got to shout up from the rooftops so everyone in Alaska would hear, what would, what would be the one thing you think that you're going to tell everyone, especially kind of regarding uh, what we've learned in the movie from a federal standpoint, but also here in Alaska? Um, well, I'd like to say that I thought there were um, two numbers in the film that I thought were extremely important and that really help uh, illustrate the problem. And the, the first number is when um, when it, uh, someone, I think it was Ellen Weintraub, was talking about how Congress has a 15% approval rating. And I, and I think that's probably shared among many Alaskans where generally people do not have a high approval rating of Congress. And why is that? because individual Americans have the sense that Congress is not responsive to their needs and is not doing what they want. And, and we know that's true. Studies have shown that that's true. 
And then the other number I think is really important is that, and, and this is a sad number, is the 91% of Americans that feel that it's impossible to reform our system. And, and that is really sort of frightening also because um, if we don't have the buy-in from Americans that we run a legitimate system that's basically fair and where we have fair outcomes for every citizen, then uh, we really run the, the risk of, of losing that support for our democracy in general. And so I think it's extremely important that um, we educate uh, Americans and Alaskans about the importance of this issue. And from our standpoint, we think we have an answer. And, and so that's where our group would come in, our move to amend, which would be to amend the US Constitution to start making these reforms to our democracy. So Congress can deliver um, and meet the needs of regular Americans. David. Yeah, I was gonna to go to you to kind of bounce off that, but you have a, you have a follow up. Yeah, I do. I mean, uh, the, the rating of Congress as an institution has varied anywhere from about 9% to 30%, depending upon which year. So it's it's way underwater, no matter when you ask it over the last 30 years. But what's different is when you ask people what they think about their own congressperson, uh, a significant majority like their own congressperson. And that gets us back to one of the reforms, and that is redistricting. You know, America is based on competition and choice to a great extent, right? We don't have adequate competition and adequate choice in our current duopoly system. Uh, right now, there's only two state legislatures, I think, in the country that have divided legislatures, meaning one party controls both houses of the legislature in all but two states, and one state has a unicameral legislature. We just had a, a census, all right? Uh, we're reallocating seats. Uh, and the lines are going to have to be redrawn, not just for the federal offices, but also but for the state uh, offices as well. And the party who's in control of the legislature will end up having a disproportionate impact on how those lines are drawn. And now we have a situation where a vast majority of the seats in the House of Representatives are safe, which means that uh, you know which party is going to win. You just don't know which person's going to win. Uh, and therefore, in states that don't have integrated and open primaries, which you're now going to, and if they have a closed party primary, it means the Republican representative is concerned about getting passed on the right, the Democratic representative is getting concerned about getting passed on the left, which forces more extremism, which forces the reinforces the ideological divide. Uh, and so redistricting reform has clearly got to be part. It's not as big a deal you know, obviously it's not a big deal at all at the federal level for Alaska, you've only got one, you know, uh, Congress, but it's probably a deal at the state legislature. I don't know what the Senator thinks about that, but it's probably a deal at the state legislature. And for most states, it's a big deal at both the federal and, uh, and the state legislative level. level. Senator, you want any, any thoughts? Yeah, I definitely think you need redistricting reform. You know, in, in Alaska, we had, our system, uh, under our original constitution, we had the redistricting board, five members all appointed by the governor uh, until there was a democratic governor and there was uh, a super majority of Republicans who controlled the legislature. They changed the constitution. Uh, you, need, you need redistricting reform, clearly. Uh, the Democrats control it. They, uh, uh, you know, both parties sort of game the system out and, the syst and it's encouraged. It's, it, you know, the way our system is, that is encouraged. And uh, the public, I think, for the most part, doesn't even realize that it's broken. But yeah, definitely need need redistricting reform. And as we kind of get towards the Q and A, I want to get um, you know, one more time for the panelists um, to to chime in. But I, I think you know, again, here is locally as as Alaskans, and then uh, federally, what's what's happening. Um, you know, these this seems to be very popular. It seems to be something that you know, polling at a state level or national level, that people want to see these changes. And you know what? What do we want to do uh, when we talk to our friends or family or colleagues or networks? You know what? How do we encourage them to talk to our elected leaders to do a change? It's, and it's more than just um, you know writing an email, right? And it be, or being a part of a group. But but Dave, I'd like to start with you. You know, this is something you've talked at a at a national level. You know, in different regions. You know, when you talk to people about something that's so popular, what what when you tell them? You know, this is eighty percent. You know, popular across America or in your region, but 
but this can't pass because your senator won't vote for that. What what's your response to that? How do we how do we talk to people about something that's so popular but but doesn't really have the momentum yet um, for, for these big changes? Well, I think the film can help in that. I mean, because basically people have to understand what the potential adverse consequences are for the country, the state, and for themselves and their families, you know, because of the, because of the current dysfunctional system, uh, if you will. Uh, and the fact that one of the reasons that we're not making progress on a lot of the issues we need to make progress on, you know, fiscal, environmental, infrastructure, immigration, healthcare, et cetera, is because the political system uh, it, it, it needs, needs reform as well. Um, uh, you know, you also have to break down the reforms. Some of these things can be done by the parties. Some of these things can be done by state legislatures. Some of these things can be done through initiative and referendum to the extent that states have initiative and referendum. We don't at the federal level. Okay. And not all states do. And some of these things will require constitutional amendments. And so the degree of difficulty in trying to, you know, achieve these things is very different depending upon, you know, how you get it done. But I think public education engagement is absolutely key. I mean, you know, as I said, we got over 80% support for a whole range of reforms dealing from taxes to social security to health care to political reforms to defense reform, over 80%, all right? Uh, but yet we're not making any progress in Washington. And part of that is because one of the biggest deficits this country has had for quite a while is a leadership deficit. Mm -hmm. We have too many people living for today, not enough people helping to create a better tomorrow. And the truth is we may be the greatest country on earth. Our country is at risk. We are seriously at risk, both internationally and domestically because of a lot of these sustainability challenges. Uh, and, and we're gonna have to start making some tough choices sooner rather than later uh, if we want our future to be better than our past. Senator, I'll, I'll pass the question to you. Um, you know, what, from a constituent standpoint, you know, how, how do we get constituencies or, or groups to kind of, to bring this to a level of, of importance that um, you and your colleagues in Juneau, um, you know, see this as, as, a, as a vital legislation and, and a piece that needs to be passed and momentum that needs to happen? That's the real challenge, I think. I, I, and I, but I think this is the way to go. I think it's just grassroots effort, efforts. It's going out, it's, it's doing meetings like this, Zoom meetings, it's, uh, it's going to rotaries, it's going to community councils, it's going meeting with small groups of people and just explaining to them that really our democracy is at risk, that we are, this, this is a grave situation. Uh, I think most people realize that, that our government is broken, it's just not working, but they, they don't really understand why. And, uh, you know, you, you look at these wildly popular uh, campaign finance reform, redistricting reform, all these things, wildly popular, 70, 80% or higher. Uh, why can't we get them done? And then I just think in meetings like this, getting out letters to the editor, going on radio programs, uh, you know, quite frankly, one of the things um, I'd like to see, maybe not uh, real popular in this group, I don't know, is the fairness doctrine. I think uh, doing away with that doctrine, which required a balanced, uh, he hearing both sides of the story, uh, requiring that both sides of the story were presented. Uh, I think that's been damaging to our democracy. You need an educated populate, populace in a democracy. And I think you have right now people just getting the news from their own particular source with complete disregard for the other side. Uh, I, I think that would be uh, really something that could uh, change, change the game. Julie, uh, move to amend here in Alaska. Uh, tell us a little bit about um, kind of the next steps or what you guys are focused on or, or even how people might, um, if they're excited or, or interested, um, what's next to, to get people excited to move with you? Well, we're really excited because we really feel we're uh, making a lot of progress this year. So we've been able to uh, bring in the funding to be able to hire a part-time uh, executive director, staff person. So we're really looking forward to being able to use that, utilize that person's skills to help us do outreach. So on our list is going back to all the community councils in Anchorage. We have, uh, we're looking at doing outreach to the chambers of commerce around Alaska, again, to try to reach a different audience. Um, we have, we're doing outreach to tribal organizations and such. So uh, we've really been working hard to do that outreach. Um, and we actually um, do have a, uh, some Republicans that are a part of our group. In fact, one has been uh, working on circulating a letter to former Republican presidents of the Alaska Senate to get their 
uh, sign on in support of this amendment. So we've been working hard on that. Um, I know there's a question in the chat about um, if this is identified as a blue issue. And I think um, sometimes it is, especially if we start out the conversation talking about Citizens United, because I think a lot of people think, oh, overturning Citizens United is a blue issue. But if, but if we change that terminology, terminology and couch it in terms of, um, isn't it time to get big money out of politics? Are you concerned about people in San Francisco and the Sierra Club influencing Alaska elections? Then that's something people on you know, the more conservative side can really relate to. Um, I know I also heard recently that um, these days, apparently Democrats are larger beneficiaries and recipients of dark money than Republicans. So it used to be that it seems Republicans had the advantage from a dark money perspective, but that's not really the case anymore. And so I think when the consequences of that affect both parties equally, then everybody starts becoming concerned about the effects of that. And, um, you know, just another sort of little anecdote um, in the race, Alaska race for um, Senate last year between Sullivan and Gross, I think everybody was tired of the number of postcards coming to their mailbox. You know, it would be one, two, three postcards a day. And that was just so such um, obvious evidence of the huge amounts of money that were pouring into the race. So I think um, Alaskans overall um, have become much more aware about um, the influence of outside groups coming into our elections. So um, I would like to encourage everybody to check out our website, uh, akmovetoamend.org, and uh, we'd love to have your volunteer help and or donations. So uh, come check us out. Thanks, Julie. Uh, yeah. Dave, what, what, do you, what do you say when people when people kind of throw, hey, this is a blue issue, or I'm a conservative, and this isn't, you know, this isn't a priority for me? What, what's a what's a good response, or, or what what pops in your head when people say things like that? Well, I think the words that you use matter. I mean, you you need to be able to uh, explain to people what you're talking about, what the adverse consequences are, what are some potential ways to resolve the issue. And you need to do it in ways that are, you know, fact-paced, nonpartisan, non-ideological. All right, um, you know, I do agree, by the way, with the senator that we need to restore some type of fairness doctrine. And I think we have, we don't have news anymore. We have opinion, uh, and you know, it, it's one thing to have opinion, but you ought to be able to start out with some facts <laughs> uh, before you go into opinion. We don't get that that much, and and and, and we have too many Americans that are getting their their information from a, a source that's either slanted to the left or slanted to the right. Uh, and that's a problem. And that's clearly contributing to our dysfunctionality. Oh, by the way, look at the at the uh, some of the Senate races this last uh, year. Uh, look at Georgia, look at Maine as an example. Most of the money that went into those races came from out of state and a lot of them were special interest groups. So, I mean, you have to look you have to look at examples of, of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that people can relate to and understand um, that they're, you're supposed to be electing people are going to represent you, and yet money is coming in, uh, in many cases, not transparent uh, from sources that frankly have little to do with your state. I think in the past 12 years, the amount of outside spending that has happened in Alaska uh, elections uh, for our U.S. Senate races and, and such um, you know, has most Alaskans, again, why it's so popular for us to try to change it is because it's just uh, exponentially grown since Citizens United, like in many states. But Alaska, you know, generally seen as kind of a, a cheaper place to influence because of our small media markets. Um, it really has um, become a, uh, a big issue up here. And I think there, the momentum in Alaska is, is probably growing, I would, I would definitely um, suggest. Uh, there's, a, there's a question about uh, celebrities joining an effort to get this to high profile. And I won't I won't ask Daniel if he knows any celebrity friends. You know, now he's a uh, as a film director. But uh, Daniel, who has, has what's been the, the response in terms of you know people who maybe you didn't think of or groups you didn't think of um, who have said, "Wow, I've watched this and um, I was moved by this. And I want to help out." Is there anyone that's been uh, uh, shocking or surprising, or or has it been what you expected? Uh, I don't know if I've had a lot of expectations or quite how I quite how I dialed them in, to be honest. So it's all been sort of a pleasant surprise. You know, then um, insofar as certain people are 
clearly very politically engaged and already have their nose in these issues, then sure, it doesn't, I, those maybe were my expectations that folks like that would find it agreeable or think that it was a useful tool. But yeah, how often people who maybe don't have a ton of bandwidth for a political doc would still say like, oh, that was not only ingestible, but really relevant, you know? Hey, hey. <laughs> that's all good. Anyway, um, oh, I do want to quickly, that distraction was a good opportunity for me to say, I wanted to say to Juanita that um, we, the only broadcast deal we've gotten so far has been PBS and it's not a nationwide, every PBS network at once. It's every different uh, PBS outlet or affiliate station gets to choose to program it when they like, which in some sense has been cool because we've been able to promote it regionally and kind of get some energy around it. Uh, to my knowledge, we have not aired on PBS Alaska. So if anyone here wants to call them up and tell them to do it, then that would be one way that your friends could tune in or your less tech savvy friends could take advantage of what these groups have put together here. Um, you know, I'm sure that Brad or Julie would be capable of extending this a, another couple hours or something if you need to uh, have, if you have some friends you want to have stream it. But yeah, as far as it is nice to see it on TV and so far PBS is the way. Additionally, we'll be releasing it through the streaming verse, you know, uh, Vudu, iTunes, those kinds of places where you can purchase it. And then it's not, still not a broadcast network, but it's another way to watch it when you want, I guess, and further bolsters the sense of credibility, I hope. When you want to tell your friends about it, they can just look it up. Um, so that'll be coming out, I think, later this month, but keep it, or not, sorry, at the beginning of next month, but you can follow us online if you wish, or keep it, just engage with us uh, to stay tuned about the film. And I, I appreciate the, quen the question. Um, I was looking at your name while I said that, so I almost said Juanita, but I appreciate the question, Juanita. So, but yeah, to get back to what you were asking, Jason, I, I think that I've just been very pleased at how readily people are willing to reach out from their ideological entrenchments uh, with regard to these issues. You know, it's, you, you don't have to set aside your concern about something that is aligned generally with the left or the right in order to wake up to the fact, as others on the panel have already said, that you're not likely to get a lot of meaningful traction on those issues until the political system itself works and is more directly responsive. And um, until those of us who are the true stakeholders are really the only ones with a lot of influence. You know, I think like, the basic concept of lobbying makes a lot of sense. Industries and individuals wanting to talk about how things will affect them, tell the government directly, that all makes sense. But this degree of influence that's been obtained makes no sense, has no basis in the constitution, is fundamentally wrong. And so why would you let your partisan affiliation or political ideology get in the way of that if it's blocking you from representative government? So enough people seem to see that and see that that's what we're about. You know, some people take issue with discussion of article five some people take issue with this or that but for the most part everyone's in they can see that we're not necessarily advocating for any one solution we were open to a range of solutions and that those might be coming from different political wings or they might not really belong to any political ideology but they might have been associated with it for a long time and therefore folks to have a knee-jerk reaction to it or it doesn't sound right to them but people can see that largely we're just trying to increase awareness of these sort of fundamental changes that will make government itself more responsive. And it's been a pretty positive, my experience anyway, with the, feed, the feedback people have given me to my face has all, has all been pretty pretty solid. So thank you for the question. Well, uh, thank you, Dave. That's a great uh, kind of way to wrap this up. As, as we do wrap up, I do want to thank our co-host tonight, Alaska Common Ground, uh, Alaska Move to Amend, American Promise, Alaska, Braver Angels, Alaska, the Fix US Alaska group and Alaskans for Better Elections. Uh, one last question from uh, from Mr. From Mr. Brad Keithley, actually, and, and uh, Senator and uh, Dave, if you want to take a poke at this as we wrap up. Yes, short of a US constitutional amendment, what are some additional steps we can take to limit the influence of money at a state level? And Senator, we'll, we'll start with you well, and I think, Mr. Walker, wrap it up. Yeah, I think, I think in Alaska, one of the biggest things that we can do is to, to protect the court system. There, we, I think the way we appoint our court, our uh, judges is uh, one of the best in the nation. It's not, it's not political. Uh, judges, uh, at least initially, don't run for, uh, don't run for uh, to become a judge. 
and so you have that corrupting influence. Uh, I think that has really insulated the judiciary here in Alaska. And there are tremendous attempts to change that. And I think that it would be extremely damaging. Um, and I also think another thing, which I personally is a little bit damaging uh, is that we, uh, it's, in Alaska is called rule eight to attorney's fees. That's a loser pays. And I know uh, people say, oh, it's fundamentally fair, loser pays. The problem is if you file a lawsuit to protect your rights, to protect the rights, um, even in a constitutional matter in some cases, you can go bankrupt if you're a middle class. And so what that does is it really uh, takes access away from the middle class to the court system. The, the wealthy can afford it. The poor, if there's a judgment against them, they get hit with a million dollar attorney's fees. They just won't pay it. But the middle class really stand to get uh, to get slammed by that. So just another little thing, I, or rather a big thing, I think would benefit uh, Alaskans. And David, if you'd like, we get to, we get to the last quickly, I would say uh, for state races, you may want to take a look at some of the states that have voluntary public financing. Again, it's voluntary. You don't have to do it. Uh, it limits how much money that you can take for any particular individual. Uh, and if you end up meeting certain thresholds and you get a public grant and your spending is limited to that, uh, to that, uh, the amount of that public grant, uh, you know, uh, Connecticut is one example, although I do think that their system needs reform. For example, they give money to people who don't have political opponents. I don't think that's a real good idea. Uh, and the whole idea is you're supposed to be running a campaign uh, to try to be able to win the election, not just to try to be able to keep your name out there. Oh, that's great. Um, it is 601, and I know, like we mentioned, uh, Anchorage is having great weather. I know people are probably chomping at the bit to get back outside or enjoy dinner, but I want to thank our panel. Uh, this was a, a fab, just a, a great discussion. Um, this was recorded, and uh, I know the link will probably be up on the Facebook page uh, that you probably saw uh, promoting the event. Um, but if you have questions, um, please go to that Facebook page and, and um, post those questions. Or if you need more information, I know there's plenty of people who would love to connect regarding this issue. Um, different groups and different individuals. And so, uh, again, want to thank our panelists, want to thank Alaska Common Ground, Alaska Move to Amend, American Promise Alaska, Braver Angels Alaska, Fix US Alaska, and Alaskans for Better Elections. Um, panelists, thank you. And uh, everyone, uh, enjoy the night. And uh, hopefully we'll see you as we get momentum moving in our state and across the country on this important issue. Thank you.